Okay, so uh, let us go back to uh, our course. This is the third lecture. So thanks for being here also today. And uh, uh, just to recall what we were speaking about. So we were speaking about uh, uh, Eisenberg group. Which I denoted H. In this, uh, uh, in this group, uh, we have uh, considered uh, Carnot curves that are uh, curves um, which satisfy some constraint. And we have seen also the link with uh, uh, the isoperimetric problem. Uh, and this uh, permitted us to uh, define a distance. Uh, so, uh, distance, which I called uh, the SR, uh, sub Riemannian distance or Carnot Caratelodori distance. Uh, so, let me write it. So, some, someone asked me yesterday, so maybe I will pay. Uh, occasion to uh, tell you why these two names are associated to this uh, sub uh, uh, geometry. Uh, so this is related uh, to a paper of uh, 1909 of uh, Cara Teodori on uh, foundation, let's say mathematical foundation of thermodynamics, where uh, he, uh, he was considering um, uh, adiabatic transformations and uh, in some sense, he gave geometric interpretation of this adiabatic transformation, uh, transformation that you can find in Carnot cycles, uh, and in terms of uh, uh, being tangent to some mm, distribution or uh, some vector field. So, in some sense, the, uh, a first, uh, uh, a first um, uh, appearing of, of, of this geometry was in, in this. Uh, in this. So this was called by Gromov, I think, Carnot Caratelodori uh, geometry or uh, distance. So, uh, uh, and then uh, we studied some properties of uh, this distance, uh, and, uh, uh, and for instance, we we have seen a picture of uh, the unit ball, and um, so we have seen that this distance is not uh, like an Euclidean distance, but satisfies um, an estimate, which is uh, 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 this one. Let me write it in this way. Uh, from the origin, let's say, to uh, some other point, it, this behaves like this. Okay, and uh, and this uh, gives um, uh, let's say an estimate on the size of a ball, which I call ball box estimate, which says uh, more or less that uh, you uh, you can uh, let me write it um, in this way. Uh, zero uh, r. Let, uh, let me write a ball uh, for this distance uh, uh, from the origin of radius r. And this is included and includes uh, a box that has this shape. Minus r r, minus r r, minus r squared r squared. Okay, times a constant, let's say c1. And here, similarly, we have a constant C2, minus R, R, minus R, R, minus R squared, R squared. Okay, so this is uh, what we have seen yesterday. This is a picture of the ball, and we have a box outside, and the box inside. And this box is a uh, different uh, order, okay, with respect to the radius. So, um, uh, this, uh, this estimate indeed uh, permits us to uh, understand uh, 
uh, another interesting uh, property from the metric viewpoint uh, that is the dimension of, uh, of, uh, of this space. So um, let's say to, to end up this part concerning uh, Eisenberg group, I wanted to discuss uh, uh, briefly uh, what is uh, metric dimension, let's say, dimension uh, that you can associate to a metric space and uh, see what is the dimension of this uh, Heisenberg group. So let me So metric dimension, uh, you will often mm, see uh, house of dimension when you speak about this. in the in books or literature but uh, so I will uh, do not give a, a formal definition of this house of dimension because it's not uh, I mean it's a little bit technical and maybe not very intuitive so I will give another definition that is uh, uh, almost equivalent I would say but uh, uh, that for intuition is much is much better. So uh, let me give this definition. So it's a uh, uh, false definition of uh, other dimension. Actually, what I will define is very close to another uh, notion that is called Minkowski dimension of metric space. And uh, but uh, I want to write this name because it's what you will see when you if you read papers or, or books on these notions. So uh, let us consider a metric uh, space and uh, a subset that I will call omega. Mm. And so uh, I will say that this, uh, that uh, omega as metric dimension d, the real number, let's say, uh, if, let's say real number, if um, uh, the number of ball, the number, let me call n epsilon of balls, of balls, of course, associated with this distance of radius epsilon uh, necessary to cover omega behaves like n of epsilon, let's say, equivalent to epsilon power minus d. Okay, when I say equivalent, I mean that uh, it has this order. Okay, so uh, of course for small epsilon. Okay, let us uh, try to see that this is uh, uh, very natural. So if you want, for instance, to cover example, let us take a, a, a square in R2. If you want to cover unit square, let's say unit square. You have your unit square in R2, and you want to cover it with uh, balls of uh, radius epsilon. Actually, this is more or less the same that to cover uh, with the square of size epsilon, okay? So if I want to, uh, to cover this with the squares of radius epsilon, so if this is one and this is epsilon, I will need epsilon minus two uh, uh, squares to, uh, to cover this, okay? You agree? And so in this case, this d is two. Okay, so the dimension is two. Uh, if you, uh, uh, this is exact, if you put the balls, it will not be exact, but it will have the same, uh, the same order, okay? 
there could be a constant, of course. Uh, it's not, uh, is, uh, let's say, it's qualitative, it's not uh, precisely uh, quantitative, this. But uh, this is a, a, a useful uh, way to understand, of course, if you take a cube uh, in the space, you will find uh, with the same reasoning that dimension is 3, so it coincides with the usual uh, dimension when you take, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, subsets of Rn, okay? And uh, it is uh, useful also to uh, uh, understand, uh, for instance, uh, a fractal dimension. Uh, for instance, uh, you might know that the Cantor set has a dimension which, which is logarithm of a uh, something in some other base that I always forget, but if you use this uh, this method, it's very easy to to find uh, this uh, this number. So the the Cantor set, uh, if you know, uh, do, does everybody know what is Cantor set? Yes. So the Cantor set is this one. You take uh, the segment uh, zero one. So it is a subset of the segment 0, 1. Then you uh, divide it into three interval and remove uh, the middle one. And then you iterate the same uh, procedure. So you divide this into three pieces and remove the middle one. And you continue like this. And so you will get uh, this, and then uh, you go and repeat this uh, infinitely many times. So um, what you get is, uh, is something uh, that uh, uh, is not, uh, is not uh, dimension uh, uh, one, let's say, because it's not a segment, because it contains in the end, uh, no segment, but uh, it is uh, also not dimension zero. It's not just a collection, a finite collection of points, let's say. So it has a, uh, a dimension, and if we use a dimension, uh, let's say, we can associate uh, to it a dimension that is not, uh, mm, that is a real number between zero and one. So uh, what we can do, I can use this, uh, uh, this approach and uh, it is if I want to cover this uh, the Cantor set, the Cantor set is the limit of this, so I can approximate this and then pass to the limit. So at each step, uh, I can cover the Cantor set, let's say, uh, C with. Uh, 2n, let's say, pieces, okay, I can cover it with 2n power n pieces of uh, uh, length one over three to the power n, okay? So at the first uh, step I have uh, one piece of length one, then I have two uh, pieces of length one third, then I have uh, two power two pieces of length one over three power two, etc. So if, uh, if this is epsilon, I should write n of epsilon as a, uh, as a, as a power of epsilon, so n of epsilon, what is this? Is two to the power n, but uh, I want to write it in terms of epsilon. So what is this? Is uh, uh, three, of course, I should write like this, uh, of log uh, three over two. And so you get this, uh, and this will be uh, epsilon minus log three over two. Okay? Just a standard property. And so this will be the, the dimension. This will be the dimension, it is indeed uh, a number that is between uh, 0 and 1. Okay, so did I convince you? And uh, there are many other of these uh, examples, uh, for instance, uh, the snowflake, uh, you might have uh, seen this. Uh, this construction goes like this. You take, uh, you take the segment 
and then you remove the central part and you build the uh, equilateral triangle. Mine probably is not very equilateral, but uh, and then uh, you do the same in each of these pieces. And then you iterate and you at the limit you have a snowflake. And uh, if you repeat uh, the same approach, now you even do not need the computation because uh, at each step you have four pieces of length one third, and so the dimension is log three, four. Okay, logarithm of four base three. So very, very quick. And uh, this is a number uh, that is uh, bigger than one. Indeed, this curve in the limit is something in between a curve and a surface, let's say. So it's. Uh, and uh, okay, so this was uh, and somehow just uh, maybe an excursion on other uh, uh, things. But uh, to go back to our uh, case, what do we have? We have Eisenberg group, which is uh, uh, a group uh, that we have built on R3, so something that has dimension 3. And uh, and uh, what happens is that uh, bolts, uh, in particular uh, small bolts, if you wish, okay, this estimate in the Eisenberg group works for any radius because we have seen that there is this homogeneity property. But indeed, uh, in more general situation, uh, uh, an estimate like this is valid for a small radius at least. And uh, so this is relevant when you want to uh, compute this number of balls. And what happens is that uh, since balls can be, uh, can be uh, approximated uh, by uh, boxes in this way, if you want to cover a set with the small balls, uh, a, a set of R3, uh, what, do, what do you need? So to cover a subset of R3, which I'm identifying with H with small balls, let's say a cube, okay? and then I try to uh, cover it with uh, balls. So since I have this double estimate, this will be the same, uh, the main order to cover with uh, boxes. And so what do you have? You have uh, uh, that your boxes are not uh, uh, regular, let's say, but uh, they have side epsilon here, epsilon here, but uh, epsilon square on the vertical uh, on the vertical side. So uh, how many do you need? You will need epsilon power minus 4. And so d is 4. Okay, so what is saying? This is saying that uh, uh, from a topological viewpoint the space has dimension 3 but uh, from the metric viewpoint, the space has dimension 4, okay? So it is a, this is a, another way, let's say, of uh, <laughs> detecting that uh, our geometry locally is not uh, Euclidean, okay? This is uh, saying uh, that uh, balls do not behave, are not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Lipschitz equivalent to balls, but... Uh, mm, to, to, to Euclidean balls, but um, uh, this is a rough quantity, let's say, dimensional, uh, that is saying that our geometry is not, uh, is not Euclidean. And okay, this was uh, what I wanted to say about uh, metric dimension. Do you have questions about this? Mm? Uh, just one. Uh, you <coughs> use Hausdorff dimension for bounded things. Is there generalizations for not bounded subsets? Yes. Let's say that uh, let's say that uh, omega you can take a bounded subset. 
I just know if there is uh, some things for not bounded uh, things. Uh, but if you want to define a dimension, that this will be uh, associated to uh, the, the. I mean, I agree that. Uh, this, uh, I mean, if you give a precise definition of house of animation, then you can apply it to the metric space itself. Uh, as a subset, you take the metric space and you don't care if it's uh, bounded or not. Okay. And, um, okay, so, um, Okay, maybe uh, I will move uh, on uh, uh, the next part. So in the next part, what I wanted to do is to um, uh, try to give a uh, more... Um, it was not this one, it was the other one. A more general viewpoint on... Uh, on, the, on the notion we have seen up to now. So. So the general picture we have seen up to now is uh, more or less like this. We had the space of dimension three. We had the two uh, uh, movements, admissible movements, uh, which we represented by vector fields. So uh, what I call actually infinitesimal movements. And, uh, and so what I want to do now is to uh, say something more about uh, vector fields and uh, Lie bracket and state a general theorem uh, uh, that concerns the question about connecting two points with the curves that are, uh, uh, which follows, let's say, the, the, these admissible movements given by this vector field. So, uh, in, uh, in, our, um, in our previous consideration, we have seen that uh, we have somehow identified the vector field with a, a differential equation. So, I will try to make this more formal. So, mm. so uh, a vector field, um, I will denote like this, x of x, for me, will be just a, a, a vector of functions. So, x can be considered as a map from Rn to Rn, let's say with some uh, regularity, and uh, to it we have associated uh, our uh, differential equation. So here I'm in Rn, I'm not in R3, I'm not... Uh, a, a1 of x, meaning x1, xn, an of x1, xn. Okay, so uh, this x uh, you can think as a row vector or column vector. I will identify this. And uh, um, so I can more shortly uh, write this as a x dot of t equal x of x of t. So this uh, will denote a differential, a system of differential equation, okay? So this coefficient uh, uh, you can think to be as infinity and smooth. In this case, if you couple this with uh, initial condition, let's say x0 equal, uh, x at time 0 equal x0, in this case you have existence and uniqueness of a solution of this uh, equation, okay? What, uh, what does this represent? So you are in Rn, and to make the picture, I make a picture in the plane. At every point, x is associating a vector. So this is a more or less meaning of a vector field, in the sense that at every point you have a vector, and then <coughs> what is a solution of the differential equation is a curve satisfying this uh, equation. So the, the tangent vector to the curve should be 
uh, equal to the uh, vector field at that point. So this means that a solution will be a curve that at each time is tangent to uh, the vector field. Okay, and so and then probably you will have many other, uh, not, not like this here, but maybe like this, and uh, etc. Okay, so um, this is uh, the solution of, uh, uh, of the differential equation, and, uh, um, and this is uh, sometimes denoted, so let's say, solution, let me call uh, uh, this uh, still x of t, is sometimes denoted with exponential notation, like this, so, okay? So let me write like this. And uh, this means just uh, uh, that the we apply some flow to the initial point. So it's like I take uh, my point x0 and then I move for time t along uh, the vector field x. Okay, this is just a notation for now. What I want to do now is to justify this notation and uh, uh, and then uh, to make the link with uh, the Lie bracket that we have seen. Because uh, uh, indeed this is um, this is uh, let's say a dynamical interpretation of a vector field. So as I try to explain, a vector field so is some map that to every point associate a vector, which is uh, actually a tangent vector, and then uh, we can integrate this. But uh, a vector field, for the vector field, we have used also the notation, if you remember, at some point, I have introduced, uh, uh, if we denote, let's say, by uh, like uh, uh, this, uh, the canonical basis of n, okay, if you remember at some point I used this partial derivative as a, a notation for uh, uh, the basis, then my vector field can be written also in this way, as a vector can be written also in this way, okay? Indeed, this uh, is a notation, but it's not only a notation, because uh, the vector field uh, can differentiate functions, and uh, how does the vector field differentiate functions? Is, uh, is not difficult to understand, so what, uh, what can we do? So if I take a function f, a scalar function from Rn to R, I can differentiate the function at some point. So this is my vector field that differentiates the function. So this is uh, uh, now uh, definition, if you wish. What is this? Is the derivative of the function f along the flow of x, okay? So I'm not, uh, it's a sort of partial derivative. When you differentiate, uh, when you compute a partial derivative of f, you differentiate f along some line. If I have a vector field, what I can do is to differentiate uh, scalar, uh, to compute a scalar derivative, as a derivative of a function of one variable, but along a curve, and the curve is the solution associated to, uh, to this. So let me, let me write it, uh, in this way, okay, at, at t equals zero, okay? So I have a function, I have a point uh, x, I take the corresponding curve, and then I differentiate f along uh, this curve, okay? It's a curved partial derivative, if you want. And uh, what happens is that uh, if you compute this, uh, this is not, uh, uh, difficult because uh, what is this? Uh, this is uh, the, the differential of f, okay? 
what is this? Is uh, uh, df dxi. Let, let, let's put the sum. And then I should put the derivative of this curve. xi prime. OK? Do you agree? It's just a derivative of a composition. So derivative of f with respect to xi, derivative of xi. So let me let let us denote uh, this curve uh, x1 of t, xn of t. Okay. And this partial derivative, since we satisfy the differential equation, this is just uh, the f, the xi, ai of x, okay? So you see that uh, if I write x f of x, this is just uh, putting f there. Nothing else, okay? So I'm not sure uh, I've convinced that this is interesting, but uh, we started with uh, uh, some notation, but indeed we have discovered that this is not uh, just a notation, but there is something uh, uh, behind this notation, okay? And um, so what I wanted to say is that a vector field is two things. First is uh, uh, something that uh, defines a differential equation, then a flow, so our movement for which we started. But at the same time, it differentiates also functions. Uh, what is doing, it differentiates functions along the trajectories of... Uh, so it has this uh, double uh, nature. And, um, and so um, um, what is uh, interesting is that... Uh, this exponential notation also is justified by uh, uh, is justified by the action of the vector field on functions because of uh, this uh, formula. Okay. So let us consider now uh, our. x of t, the solution of this, uh, uh, of this equation, like here, okay? I take this, okay? Then what is happening is that I can write x of t, x0, plus the integral of its derivative. Do you agree? This is just a fundamental theorem of calculus. But then, Inside this, uh, here, this is just uh, this one by the differential equation. Okay? And then if you make a Taylor expansion here, x of t, what do you have? x0 plus uh, here you can uh, make a Taylor expansion at order 0, you will have t times this quantity at x0. and then higher order, okay? So what is saying this? This is saying if you look uh, uh, to, to this and you remember that this was uh, this exponential, this is the identity plus tx plus uh, it is a small o of t and uh, a plus a small order, okay? And indeed, uh, uh, once you apply uh, this x to functions, uh, this, uh, this becomes uh, an exact, uh, uh, actually an exact formula. So I'm writing this. I hope this is not uh, too much for... But if you have questions, do not, uh, do not uh, hesitate to ask me. Uh, indeed, uh, if we take again 
our function, our scalar function, then, uh, and again, x of t is our curve, then what do we have? We have that the function evaluated on the curve, I write the Taylor expansion, what is this? When t is 0, is just the function at the, at the point. The first derivative is given by this, is by definition, so the first term will be this. Okay? And indeed, you can compute using the, this, uh, um, uh, the same rule here, but applied more than once, you can see that here you will have a true uh, exponential series. And when I'm writing this, I'm just saying that I differentiate twice the function, okay? I'm differentiating twice. And uh, etc. you have the, the full exponential series, okay? So this notation is not, uh, is not occasional, let's say, okay? And now uh, we are uh, more or less ready to uh, understand more formally what is this Lie bracket, okay, between uh, two vector fields. I hope this was not too heavy, but uh, maybe I will do this over there. If you have questions, do not hesitate. So, the Lie bracket is here. If we have uh, two of these vector fields, then uh, what do we have? We have, uh, with this, uh, we have two uh, possible interpretations. Okay, so we have uh, the associated flow. And the derivations, okay? So their actions on functions, okay? And so, uh, uh, the first uh, way to understand what is the early bracket, maybe the simplest or the one that requires uh, less uh, uh, notions, uh, if you accept what I've said, is the one as a, a derivations. Okay? So what you can do, you can just write this uh, commutation term, let's say x, y minus y, x. What is this? This is a quantity that if it is zero, it means that these two guys commute. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that if I apply this to a function, first I differentiate along y and then along x, and then I'm asking if it's the same of differentiating along x and then y. Okay? What is, uh, so, uh, this guy is zero if these two derivatives commute, okay? And, uh, and uh, the uh, geometric interpretation with flows which goes back to what uh, we have done. I will first draw the picture. So we fix a point and we follow for time t the solution associated with x, which now I can denote with this, okay? 
and then I follow for time t, I follow y. Now I can do it. I can use this point to start a new differential equation for the same time. And then I follow for time minus t, the first one, and then I follow for time minus t, the second one. So it's exactly what we have do, done of the previous, okay? So I'm not writing all the formula. And uh, what happens is that, uh, so let me write uh, in this way. It happens that this combination is the initial point plus t square this quantity plus lower order term, okay? So this is, uh, let's say, the general uh, formula behind what we have said. Uh, so this uh, correction here is at second order and uh, the coefficient of the second order is exactly the daily bracket. Just uh, um, maybe to see that this is not uh, only formal but uh, also useful, uh, let, us, uh, uh, let us consider the examples we have uh, uh, studied at the beginning. And see that uh, doing this job it was very long, but if you work like this, it's, uh, it's, it's simple. Okay, so, mm, so the example of the car, in the example of the car, we had a first movement that was uh, the derivative with respect to theta, if you remember, okay, and the second one was cosine of theta d dx plus sine of theta d dy. Do you remember this, uh, th these two uh, movements? And then if you do uh, x, y minus y, x, what you do? You have derivative of the theta of all this minus everything d, d theta, okay? But when you try to differentiate here, since there is no coefficient, uh, this term uh, gives no contribution, okay? When you try to differentiate. So the only thing you have, you have to differentiate this. So from here you get nothing. And when you differentiate this, you differentiate with respect to theta, this one, and you get exactly what we have got um, for uh, uh, the computation. Indeed, this is uh, the movement in the direction that is orthogonal to the car. Okay? Let me uh, do uh, the same also for the two uh, uh, vector fields in the Eisenberg group, so that we convince that this is very quick. In that case, a first vector was this. And the second vector was this. Okay? So if you do xy minus yx, what you do? You have this that differentiate this and uh, on the other side. So minus 
I'm not writing, but uh, on the other way. Okay? What is happening here? That when you use this to differentiate this one, the only thing that uh, will get out is when this derivative of x acts on this. So when this differentiate this, you have one half of d dz. And uh, from this, you will see, if you do the computation, you have a minus sign and you have another minus one half of the dz because this z, uh, sorry, this y go with this. And so we get uh, the dz. This is exactly, this is exactly uh, what you have got from uh, that computation. Okay, so it is uh, a little bit uh, uh, maybe formal at this stage, but you can uh, think as a first uh, approach to vector fields, geometry, and uh, maybe it will be useful. It will be useful uh, when you uh, will follow more uh, detailed course uh, on these topics. But it is a uh, first approach. So, so, uh, so this uh, Lee uh, li bracket as a uh, let's say, uh, meaning as a, a different uh, derivation and uh, as a geometric object. And to compute it, it is very easy. So in some sense, what I've said now is that uh, uh, all the computation we did at the beginning was an unnecessary, but good to, to learn. And um, OK, so uh, now I want to uh, uh, state uh, a theorem. Uh, that uh, is related to uh, the question. If I have a certain number of vector fields, and uh, I mean Rn, it is possible to connect every pair of points with curves that are always following these vector fields. Okay, so I will make this more precise and give you the answer but uh, the elements are all there. So. And, in, uh, and I think you will not be very surprised by the answer if you have understood the philosophy behind all this. So, uh, so let us consider uh, let's say k vector field vector fields in Rn. Okay, so we are asking ourselves, mm, so in this case, let's say admissible curves admissible curves are curves in Rn that are tangent to this family of vector fields. Okay? Let us denote this uh, the family. So what does it mean? This means that satisfies some differential equation of this form. Okay, so I cannot only use uh, uh, one of these vector fields uh, at each moment, but I can combine them with some functions like we did uh, at the very beginning with the car. I can use all of them uh, and mix up uh, using some uh, some function, some control. So I'm asking myself, so the idea is that I am in Rn. At each point, I have a certain number of vector fields, let's say x1, uh, xk. This defines some subspace. This subspace is moving, OK? At each point, uh, this defines. And so I'm asking if uh, with curves that are tangent to this uh, 
spaces, I can connect every pair of points. Okay? So uh, the idea is that at each point I have a certain number of admissible movements that are given by this and also some uh, movements that are not admissible like uh, in the case of the car, the movement is orthogonal but uh, I could reach that uh, movement with a combination of admissible one this was related with the fact that I could uh, do it with the leave bracket okay? so indeed the answer to the question uh, is uh, very natural and says if with all possible leave brackets of my vector field I can reach all the directions, then indeed I can uh, connect every two pair of points to, uh, with a curve that uh, is tangent. And so uh, now I will try to move blackboards in such a way that I can write this. Maybe I'll use this one. It will be easier. Okay, so. This is a uh, theorem. Uh, of nineteen thirty eight by Rashevsky and Show, they put a proved independently uh, this theorem, and so uh, this is saying. Uh, the following, that uh, if the vector fields x1, xk satisfy the condition that the dimension of the space generated by x, i, their Lie bracket, let me call j, uh, k, and iterated Lie bracket, so I can compute even uh, iterated Lie bracket, so this, uh, uh, let me remove the point, I will write it at the end, and then again uh, some uh, iterated Lie bracket, let me use, uh, and so on, all possible iterated Lie bracket. If this is equal n for every point, so this is evaluated at the point x for every x in Rn, then it is possible to connect every two points with curves that are tangent to this family in the sense I have specified there, okay? Okay, um, Okay, this is a, a kind of a natural uh, answer uh, after all this uh, this discussion. And once uh, we have uh, uh, once we have uh, um, this possibility here uh, to join every pair of points, then we can introduce uh, uh, some distance as we have done in the Eisenberg group uh, by choosing a notion of length of curves. Okay. So, uh, um, so maybe just uh, I will just uh, add a few words on this uh, iterated Lie bracket. What does it mean? By going back to the example of the two spheres that roll one onto the other, and then I will finish with uh, by showing uh, uh, some applications. Uh, what does it mean? If you uh, if you remember. 
at some point we spoke about uh, this example of two spheres that uh, were rolling one onto the other without uh, uh, spinning uh, and nor uh, uh, sliding. Okay, so two spheres, uh, let's say rolling spheres, maybe I should write. So we had this situation, a first sphere, and the second one, the first one we raise R1, the second one we raise R2, and uh, the first one is rolling. So uh, the sphere S R1 is rolling on the sphere of radius 2 uh, without uh, sliding and uh, spinning. Okay, so this uh, mm, I will not do the computations because otherwise my time will be over very quickly. But I will just give you the idea on how to use this theorem to prove uh, in which case it works or it doesn't work. So the idea is that uh, uh, this space, as I said, is a five-dimensional. Okay, so uh, configuration space. is five dimensional. And we have uh, two possible movements because uh, uh, we, uh, we are removing sliding and so we can slide in two uh, independent uh, directions and we are removing spinning which I remember means to turn the sphere above without changing the contact position. Okay? Just change the orientation. So, um, Two allowed movements, which are indeed two vector fields. If you want to write it, you can do it. You have to put some coordinates here, as I did, uh, as I told yesterday. Two coordinates for the first sphere, two coordinates for the second, and an angle. And then uh, this uh, will be uh, uh, something that is written uh, with some function, and then d d x1, d d x2 d d y1, d d y2, d d theta, okay? Not really writing this, okay? What is happening is that uh, I'm asking whether I can reach every configuration with curves that are represented by this kind of movements. So, indeed, what uh, one can do, one can try to compute the brackets. Since we have two of them, uh, we can just compute uh, uh, one uh, bracket and indeed if you compute this first bracket you will get the spinning movement, okay? Spinning movement and so what you have to do uh, to, to use uh, this theorem is now to do a, a commutator, so a combination of this with this and this with this, okay? So what does it mean? It means to compute this and to compute this, okay? In this case you will recover the sliding, okay? And look, this is not uh, very complicated. I mean, it seems uh, uh, very algebraic, but indeed, what does it mean to do a uh, commutator? We have seen this is somehow to build a loop. The first loop, so the loop will not close, but uh, uh, it's a, a sort of loop, if you wish. First movement, second, minus first, minus second. So what will be a second order bracket? Nothing but a first loop and then an inverse loop, kind of eight, okay? So this is not very complicated. Indeed, if you wish, you can try. You take, uh, of course, maybe you do not have two uh, spheres, but you have uh, one, and you can roll it on a plane, okay? 
if uh, R2 is uh, plus infinity, you are rolling a sphere on a plane, which is a sphere of infinite radius, if you wish. Uh, you can try and uh, see that if you draw a small 8 onto the plane and uh, roll the ball along this curve, you will end up uh, on some position that gives you approximate a sliding. So the sliding is not possible, but you can approximate it with the small 8. So if the 8 you have drawn is very small, you will move for short and the uh, orientation stays almost the same. Okay, this, this is the meaning, uh, let's say the mechanical meaning. If you want just spinning, just uh, draw a small circle and you will see that uh, your, your sphere will have, uh, will have turn. Okay, so, so the, two, uh, the two will uh, cancel the effect of turning and just slide somehow. Of course, as we have seen, uh, all these things, okay, the form is not there, are Taylor expansion, so it's not, uh, it's the main order, okay, but finally you, you can do it. Okay, I hope to um, have given to you uh, uh, both the statement of a theorem and uh, uh, some intuition about all these things. And uh, so what I wanted to do to finish is to uh, speak uh, for uh, maybe 15 minutes, not more than that, about uh, one recent application of uh, these ideas, which indeed are very close to the example of the car, and, uh, and which are related to the research of some colleagues, because indeed uh, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not really uh, working on this application, but I found this is very interesting. So my, my research is more related to uh, geometric questions about Sabriman geometry, let's say, uh, for instance, what is curvature in this space? What does it mean for a space to be curved? Thanks a lot for uh, helping me. And, uh, uh, and now I want uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, another uh, application that is uh, related to image reconstruction. So, uh, what you can see on the, on the slide are two examples of um, uh, what sometimes are called illusions. So, what does it mean? It means that uh, our brain can see uh, some lines or some curves even if they are not present. So, this is uh, uh, very famous. For instance, here you can see uh, a triangle, indeed two triangles probably you should see, one that points down and one points up, and but uh, the one that points up is not really there, I mean it's not drawn. So uh, our brain is somehow is completing, uh, uh, completing uh, uh, some segment there. And the same uh, happens uh, here, so somehow we can see uh, two separate uh, images uh, that uh, uh, overlap, but uh, indeed it's just one image. So it's, uh, uh, what is this process? This process is related to the fact that uh, our brain is uh, seeing something of this kind and uh, is trying to, uh, uh, to complete it. So, and find something like this. So indeed, uh, my brain uh, just did it uh, uh, without uh, asking him. Uh, I did not. Uh, I did not complete it in this way, with a very, very uh, uh, long path or very curved, and, and I did not complete it uh, with a, a straight line. So I'm not following uh, uh, an Euclidean uh, geometry, let's say. So I'm not minimizing uh, length. I'm minimizing some, something else. So uh, as I was saying yesterday, if we move uh, an object from uh, one uh, position to another, also we are naturally minimizing something. So one can ask uh, what I am minimizing when I'm doing this. If ever I'm minimizing something, but the idea is that uh, uh, our brain works by itself without asking us. and. Uh, and so, uh, the idea is, uh, if you understand our, our brain is able to reconstruct a corrupted curve, 
like this, maybe we can be able also to uh, reconstruct images. So the first one is a true image that have been uh, uh, damaged and uh, now it's difficult to recognize something. And the second one is a, a kind of a, a flow, indeed uh, could be a flow of uh, our vector field uh, we have drawn before and we have put some holes. And uh, so um, uh, what is the idea? Maybe a little bit uh, naive but uh, maybe also convincing is that uh, you can think here uh, that this uh, is uh, the path of uh, your car that arrives here and is uh, directed as uh, uh, the uh, uh, tangent to uh, this curve and uh, the same here. And you might think that uh, the model is uh, using, uh, is minimizing exactly something of this kind. So we have in the space x, y, theta, we have two movements. And uh, what we can do is exactly move uh, as a car. And uh, in this case, what are curves that uh, um, what are curves that uh, mm, mm, satisfies our uh, equations? Uh, we have just two, so I can write it uh, like this. This is a y. Okay. And then you have uh, to minimize something and uh, you can think that uh, you want to reach the initial and final position, let's say uh, from A to B, by minimizing some cost. So you have seen uh, also in the calculus of variation, you minimize uh, some cost. And here a simple one could be the sum of the square of U1 and U2, for instance. And um, okay, this is a sort of energy, you can think a sort of energy or uh, uh, mm. and indeed uh, this is not uh, uh, completely exact because uh, our curse does not really know if we go in this direction or the other, it's more projective uh, space, it's not, uh, it's not uh, really oriented. But uh, the model is uh, more or less uh, like this. So we have a, uh, a curve that is interrupted and, uh, and we, our brain uh, try to recover this and this uh, have been studied first by neurobiologists uh, which uh, understood uh, how our visual cortex uh, works <coughs> and uh, Hubel and Wiesel in 59 and they got the Nobel Prize uh, for this uh, first model of the visual cortex and then this was uh, uh, developed uh, somehow uh, in more geometric language first by uh, Jean Petitot and then by Giovanna Citti e Alessandro Sarti in quite recently, you see, 2003 and more recently uh, a lot of other people started to work uh, because somehow this model by Jean Petitot was first constructed as a, a model in contact geometry, someone mentioned this word yesterday so I can use it. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, this model was developed as a, um, a sub-Riemannian uh, geometric model because uh, uh, somehow the idea is that uh, all possible uh, movements are not equivalent. Here uh, for a curve it will be very difficult if you want to reconstruct the curve to have a curve that is closed but have the same tangent so they the somehow the, the, the movement that is orthogonal to the car that is very difficult also for the brain. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, this is a model, so it can be, it, it can uh, have a criti criticism and uh, all these kind of things. But uh, 
so you can uh, develop um, you can develop this model and the idea is that you can write this cost here and uh, this cost corresponds to something that is written this way what is this is an integral that when you write it in terms of the curve and not uh, on the in the space that contains also the third coordinate tells you that you are minimizing something that is a compromise between the length that would be the integral when this k is zero and the curvature of the curve so uh, it, it means that uh, so we are not choosing the shortest we are not uh, uh, considering only curvature effects but uh, we have a compromise of the two if you wish uh, this uh, last uh, integral is just uh, this one when rewritten uh, in the other in the other language and uh, here uh, this slide which uh, i'm not sure i want to go into the details uh, tells you uh, why you, you have this uh, equivalence between the last formula and this one so but you see uh, you see that uh, the first uh, relation says that uh, is exactly our relation tells you that the theta is the angle defined by the derivative of x and y and you can interpret this in terms of being uh, tangent to some uh, spaces and uh, so vector fields that here I'm sorry I did not uh, I did not write and uh, and so um, let us move so here I have some picture but I wanted to move so here then is it is more close to what I have uh, uh, written you have you can recognize that uh, the first system is exactly what we have written at the beginning and here you have uh, uh, you have uh, this uh, what is uh, interesting also mm, let me just mention is that uh, like in the Heisenberg group case so there is a group structure even here there is a group structure that is underlying and here the group is the group of rototranslations of the plane so you will not be surprised because uh, we are considering exactly uh, uh, exactly this kind of, uh, of object but um, uh, I want uh, just to show you uh, some pictures because uh, it was more uh, my goal was more uh, descriptive uh, than technical on this uh, uh, and uh, so this first uh, uh, this was the first attempt by uh, Yuri Sachkov who works in uh, in Bereslav in Russia uh, using um, uh, this algorithm this sub let's say algorithm to reconstruct this image once uh, damaged okay so the idea is that here uh, you must uh, tell to the uh, computer what is the point you want to connect to uh, so which point you want to connect so you, you have to give information, a lot of information. But uh, the result is quite good. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to recognize, but you can see that the holes now are recognizable, but it works quite well. Uh, the idea is that, uh, of course, we would like to have something better than this because uh, uh, we don't want to explain to the computer how to reconstruct. We want him to be able by its own to be uh, really mm, efficient so the idea to go to something more complex here I will just mention this I'm not uh, I'm not uh, giving any detail is that uh, to uh, to um, reconstruct a, an image that is more complex the idea is that if I don't want to tell to uh, the computer the black uh, zone to which one should be connected and somehow I can use a random approach and try to uh, uh, also in this case uh, uh, minimize something and use some uh, let's say some statistical approach and do some average for instance and uh, this uh, has uh, links with uh, PDs so partial differential equations and you can do this by uh, using uh, somehow uh, 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 
heat equation, so or something that looks like heat equation. If ever you have seen in your uh, uh, life heat equation on R2, it is written uh, like this. Uh, let me use this. Okay, in R2, so x, y in R2. And T is time, so you have evolution of this, that is a heat, satisfies this equation. So this is a heat-like equation where these two uh, the, the derivatives are replaced by our uh, derivatives that are given by vector fields, so uh, it seems uh, similar, but indeed it is a little bit different because uh, now the space has dimension 3 and we have only two, uh, let's say, derivatives, so uh, the equation is degenerate somehow but still has good properties thanks to our uh, uh, Lie bracket condition. So let me just uh, uh, say this. So uh, this equation is uh, uh, not that bad. Indeed, uh, um, uh, gives uh, diffusion. And the idea is to use uh, this diffusion to treat uh, uh, the image as a function, an initial datum for the uh, uh, heat equation, and uh, diffuse the heat. Okay, so you transform somehow the image into a function that uh, at each point tells you uh, a number between 0 and 1 if you are black, white or uh, a scale in between and then uh, put this data into uh, this uh, sub-Riemannian heat equation. And it is interesting because this heat equation now takes uh, your data and gives you something. So the heat equation is an evolution equation, so you have to uh, uh, say how much time you wait and so this will be for very very small time so if you if you put a unit of it in this point after even very little time this it will be diffused everywhere of course very far you will have a low temperature but a low change of temperature but you can feel it everywhere so indeed if you put as initial datum uh, an image which is corrupted, then uh, you will have uh, an image which uh, indeed has a, a grayscale, let's say, at every point, but um, of course uh, uh, also the part of the image that was uh, original now is, uh, is changed because uh, this diffusion, of course, uh, uh, affects every point. But still, uh, this uh, gave good results. So these images are uh, from Hugo Boscain, which is uh, uh, at CNRS in, uh, in, uh, at Sorbonne University. And, uh, and then what they try to do is to refine, indeed, uh, this uh, algorithm to, uh, to get something better, because, uh, uh, of course, this algorithm here is good because it does not use the information of where the image is damaged, but at the same time it was not very efficient. So these uh, have been uh, uh, improved with some uh, discretization procedure. Uh, so there is of course a lot of uh, techniques behind this and uh, I'm not uh, uh, even an expert of this and so I'm just uh, illustrating you uh, what does it mean to apply a theory to a real situation and uh, and in this case uh, it is uh, I got uh, I also was very surprised when they told me that they could uh, uh, get out something about uh, this picture so you can uh, even uh, do something with pictures that are corrupted at 95 percent of pixels so of course this pixel should be distributed in some uh, some way because uh, if you have a big hole uh, it, it, it is difficult but uh, indeed the the algorithm was able to, to reconstruct, and we can recognize uh, a colleague of us, that is uh, Jean-Paul Gauthier, working in Toulon. And then uh, also a uh, very, very <coughs> damaged picture, uh, like this one, have been, uh, uh, have been possible to reconstruct. This looks quite incredible at least to me, and, uh, and indeed, uh, let me say that probably this improvement uh, now goes uh, uh, beyond. So we started with the idea on understanding how the brain works, and this is uh, 
much more than what our brain is uh, able to do. Uh, to uh, my best understanding, this, uh, uh, I mean, is a method that is uh, comparable uh, with actual uh, uh, methods that you can, uh, um, that you can uh, uh, obtain with uh, other, let's say, mathematical techniques. So I'm not uh, showing uh, uh, something uh, revolutionary. The, the interest is uh, uh, that uh, some mathematics that have been developed from uh, a really theoretic viewpoint and from geometry that uh, have been developed in the last 30 years because uh, okay this theorem is uh, from the 30s but uh, all the rest is quite recent uh, can help also to answer uh, let's say uh, real questions so maybe give uh, give new insight on uh, on uh, on problem that we were studying with other techniques so i hope that uh, all this uh, uh, was uh, uh, interesting for you and will be useful when you will meet these notions in the future and i thank you for your attention Thank you, Davide. Yeah. Yes. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, in the case of Supermanent geometry, how do you define curvature as, as a number, or if you say... Ah, this is a difficult question. Okay, okay. I will ask for uh, other two lectures. <laughs> Okay. No, is uh, is uh, is quite different uh, from the case of uh, Riemannian geometry. If you know that case, is uh, quite different. So you can build something that um, looks like uh, a sectional curvature, but is not exactly the same. So um, maybe I can give you more details. Uh. And actually, that's a subject of research of David. Yeah, it's, say, a, so it's, 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 it's one. It's a quite a recent. Uh, yeah, is is really one of the topics where I have uh, worked in the last year. So it's uh, it, it's more or less also still open question in some sense. I mean, we have some definitions, but we are trying to to see if the good ones. Are there any more questions or comments? No? Okay. So otherwise, we thank David again for the beautiful course. <laughs>